Chapter 25, The Child with Cardiovascular Dysfunction. Cardiac catheterization uh, is where we thread a catheter up through a vein and inside the heart to help diagnose cardiac uh, um, anomalies and also we can treat some. Where you're probably going to see a child is after they've come back from having a cardiac catheterization done. So some of the complications that you're going to be watching for are hemorrhage from the site and usually that's going to be femoral where they introduce the catheter, so that's where you're watching. Low-grade fever, nausea and vomiting, loss of pulse in that catheterized extremity, so both the, the um, pulse there femorally and also distally from that, and then transient dysrhythmias. You put a catheter inside the heart, let it kind of bump around, you get some little irritated spots inside the heart that will throw some extra beats and those usually uh, are not a significant problem and they resolve on their own without any um, treatment. They just need to be watched. Now some rare and serious side effects would be the possibility of stroke, seizures, tamponade, or death. Congenital heart diseases, this is a big part of this chapter. This happens about five to eight out of every 1,000 live births two to three of those are going to be symptomatic in the first year of life and of those symptomatic in the first year of life many are in the first minutes of life but many you can see a good portion of them are not symptomatic that uh, they may not realize till considerably later in life that there is a problem cardiac defects are a major cause of death in the first year of life prematurity being the highest uh, cause and they follow after that. The most common anomaly we see is a ventricular septal defect and more than a quarter, 28% of kids who have some sort of conge congenital heart disease have some other anomaly. So not only did the heart not form right but another organ or multiple organs did not form correctly. Some things that can cause congenital heart disease in the mother would be certain illnesses, rubella being one of those, uh, alcoholism, exposing the fetus to uh, high levels of alcohol, maternal age, and this goes along with having um, other problems, heart disease or congenital heart disease being one of them. And then if the mother has a chronic illness, something like diabetes, that puts the child more at risk. We know there's a genetic side to it because if one sibling has a heart defect, it's more likely other siblings will, or if the parent had a heart defect, then the children are more likely. If there's chromosomal problems, such as Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21, those kids have a real high risk of having a, a heart defect or any other congenital anomalies. So again, if one organ doesn't, didn't develop right, often multiple organs didn't develop correctly. We need to remember fetal circulation as we start looking at these heart defects. Um, remember, you've got your umbilical vein and arteries. We've got the foramen ovale, which is an opening between the right and the left atria. We've got the ductus arteriosus, which allows blood to bypass the lungs. So it comes out of the right side of the heart and crosses over to go systemically instead of going to the lungs. And then the ductus venosus really is not a problem when we're talking about uh, congenital heart defects because once the placenta is not working and those umbilical uh, vein and arteries aren't working, there's no blood flow through that so it stops functioning. So it's not a problem on our defects. And here's a picture just to remind you of, uh, you can see the foramen ovale there between the right and the left atria and the ductus arteriosus if you follow up from the right ventricle where it should go out the pulmonary arteries to the, the lungs, there's that little opening there that goes straight to the aortic arch. Those are um, the fetal uh, circulation that should close after birth. So some key concepts I want you to think about as we talk about the different defects. 
is that blood is always going to flow from the area of high pressure to the area of low pressure. Now another way to say that is that blood's going to take the path of least resistance. If there's an easy way to go, that's the way it's going to go. Size and volume correlate to pressure. So if you're trying to push blood through a straw and through a garden hose with the same amount of blood, the same pressure, it's going to go through the garden hose and not through the straw. And volume, if you're trying to push twice as much blood, if you have two straws and on one you're pushing a certain amount of blood and the other you're pushing twice as much, it's going to be at a higher pressure, harder to push more through the same uh, volume. Um, in the past we divided our defects up cyanotic and acyanotic. Cyanotic meaning blood that um, is deoxygenated goes to the body instead of going to the lungs and getting more oxygen. And your, I, I went the opposite order of these, but anyway, and your acyanotics, we're adding more oxygen into already oxygenated blood, but we're not sending deoxygenated blood out to the body. Now, that's not necessarily a great way to divide things up because sometimes on the acyanotic diseases, the, the acyanotic defects, they may look cyanotic. And on some of the cyanotic defects, they might be pink and they really don't look bad. Um, so it's not a great way to classify them. So instead, we've gone with newer classifications that divide them up by where the blood is going. We have increased pulmonary blood flow, decreased pulmonary blood flow, obstruction of the outflow from the heart, and the mixing of the blood. And if you look at this, it is just a little more specific than the cyanotic and the acyanotic, but you can still kind of use those, but then it's further divided up. The old classifications, the really good memory aid for those, all the ones that fall under cyanotic defects started with a T, except for hypoplastic left heart. So you only had one that you had to remember separately. Um, we do have those divided a little more specifically now, but that should still help you to remember if it starts with a T, somehow I'm sending deoxygenated blood to the body. This is a picture that shows the normal pressures and the normal uh, percentages of oxygen. If you get to see a cardiac cath report on a patient, um, having this might help you because that's really what they're looking at is dip, different oxygen and pressure gradients and what they should be and what they actually are to help figure out where the blood is flowing. And you're going to have kids on monitors. Um, this is the way the monitor should be set up. We've got three leads at Children's are usually mostly three leads, so right and left on the upper chest and then on the left abdomen. Now we're going to start talking about specific defects, but before we do that I want to give you my analogy of congestive heart failure. I know you did that in your adult class already uh, when you looked at heart uh, disease of the adult, but I refer to this analogy a lot so I want to um, give it to you. I say that congestive heart failure is like a McDonald's drive through A car comes in, it gets processed through the, the drive through window and it gets sent out. And for every car that comes in, a car goes out until lunchtime hits. And when lunchtime hits, 10 cars come in for every one that, that the window is able to service and send out. So we get a huge packing in of cars in that uh, drive-through um, line trying to get into the window, trying to get into the heart. That's what kind of the basic picture of what conge congestive heart failure is. Now most of us say, forget this, I'm not staying in this line, and so we pull out and park in the parking lot, right? The difference with our heart versus the McDonald's drive through is it would be as if the entire parking lot only fit compact cars. So all of the compact cars can pull out and park, but none of the SUVs and vans. 
and in your blood, the compacts are the water and the electrolytes. Big things like proteins and, you know, huge things like uh, blood cells, they can't get out. They have to stay inside there. But the water and the electrolytes can move out, and that makes edema. The difference being there's only one window at the drive through There's two sides of your heart, so you have to think about which, uh, what is the parking lot for the side of the heart that the, the blood is having trouble getting into. Where is that parking lot that the cars are, the water is going to pull out from? Now, preload and afterload. Afterload is all that pressure of all those cars trying to jam into that line. It's what's left after a car gets sent out of the drive through how much is left trying to get in. That's your afterload. Your preload means the heart actually could serve as every single car that comes into the drive through except there's construction right at the end of the drive through so the cars can't get out of it out in front of the heart. So pre, like prefix, you know, before. So in front of the heart, what it's trying to send into, there's a construction zone and the cars are having trouble leaving. So you still get that backflow happening, but the problem is because of something out in front of the heart, not the heart itself. So that is preload. Preload turns into afterload and afterload can turn into preload for the other side of the heart. Hopefully that picture is making sense to you. Um, I think we're going to move into defects now, so I think I'll stop here.